Thank you. Uh, so, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Miro, and I work for Red Hat, and I do a lot of Python. Uh, I guess you are here, so you probably do a lot of Python too, or you at least want to. Uh, and when I code in Python, I usually do one thing. I put everything to GitHub and open it publicly, make it open source, because I think that open source is better than anything else uh, when it comes to code and content as well. And having the code on GitHub brings me wonderful things. People are sending me pull requests, or they are not, because they are not interested, but that's not fair, sorry. Uh, what I can do is use some services that help my workflows. And one service I very much like is Travis CI. If you don't know that, uh, Google it up. It's a continuous integration service. And it's awesome because it runs my test automatically every time I push or every time somebody makes a pull request. What's a bit sad about it is if you want to have your tests being run every time, uh, you actually need some tests. <laughs> and we probably all know that tests are great. They are good, and we should write them, and we should write them first. And uh, test without, uh, uh, code without tests is buggy. Uh, we all know those kind of things. But at the end, uh, we say, uh, I don't have time for writing tests. Writing tests is too, too difficult. This code is too complicated. I, I won't write tests. It's, uh, let's, let's go and have a beer instead or something like that. And uh, then if you don't write tests and you, you want to learn something about tests, uh, you usually find some examples on the web. And those examples pretend your code is this. Pretend this is a piece of code. It can be a function, it can be a module, it can be a package, it can be a box, it can be a cat that's either dead or alive, stuff like that. And uh, usually you have some input, uh, you have some output, and if you test your code like this, you put something in, you see what's going out of that. And if it's what you expected, then your, your tests are green, everything is great. If it's something you didn't expect, then something is wrong. Either the test is wrong, or your code is wrong, or the weather uh, in North America is wrong at that point. Um, this is a simple example of such tests. Uh, there is a, I think it's a kid's game called FizzBuzz. So you say numbers like one, two, and so on. But uh, if their number is dividable by three, you say fizz instead. And if it's dividable by five, you say bus instead. And if it's both, you say, you say fizz bus. And writing a code for this is uh, simple. It's uh, two ifs or three ifs and stuff like that. And writing tests for this kind of code, uh, that's easy as well. It's absolutely classical academical example. You have a function and you put something in. On the first test, we put the number three in, and we assert that it has some output. Writing tests for those functions is easy, simple, and probably everybody can do that. In reality, our functions look like this. And it doesn't have one input, one output. Look what it got. It has everything. So it has some inputs. Then it uh, has a hook to the database. Then it uh, has a magical vortex that spins around and swirls and uh, that may or may not interfere with your function or with your package or whatever. There is probably an API that your code is using and stuff like that. And when it comes to this, people say, uh, the tests are really, really hard to write. And what shall we do? Well, you have basically two options. Either you don't write stuff like this, but yeah, we, we know our people. Uh, so you can um, don't test it, or you can mock it, cheat it, remove the vertex, replace it with some fake vertex, remove the database, replace it with SQLite, uh, or even a dictionary or something like that. Uh, when your code touches arbitrary files, 
on your computer, such as this one. Uh, you can't really test it on other machine than yours. If it uses a production database, you should, and you want to run your tests on production database, you are being crazy. So you need a copy of the database and stuff like that. And especially in cases when something that is not under your control can interfere with your code, uh, usually you say, let's mock it. Or you say, let's something else it, and you don't write your tests. <laughs> when it comes to mocking, um, Usually, uh, there is a little bit of confusion because there is a, like, a big thing called mocking that includes various kind of mocking, and one of those things is mocking. That's kind of big confusion with names, so let's call it cheating. Um, and when I say cheating, it's not necessarily something that's wrong. Uh, cheating is great if you cheat uh, when you program and you get the good results, you're actually a better programmer, I guess. But it's not something they will teach you on the university, though. Uh, when you use cheating to, to write your tests, uh, it's still a little dangerous. It's not dangerous like somebody sees you cheating and says you should not cheat, we fire you, or something like that. But uh, if you overcheat your tests, you can end up in hell, or your project, at least. There are several ways of cheating. I decided to uh, talk about those four. Fakes, stops, mocks, and spies. Usually when you have a mocking library, or a cheating library, in fact, usually called a mocking library, uh, it offers several of those. Maybe sometimes it offers more, but usually it offers those four. Let's go over those four a little bit. I will try to explain what they do, uh, why they are good, what they are good for, why they are bad, what they are bad for, and then you should never use them at all. Let's have an imaginary vortex class. That's the picture before. And it can swirl. We don't really know what it does. It may be dangerous. It may, uh, or your computer, or all your money from your bank account. And it returns a thing that looks kind of like vortex. And then it has a double swirl, which is just an example that you return one swirl plus another swirl. Is this code understandable? OK. So let's have a fake. Imagine you need the double swirl is not there. Uh, Vortex is some library you don't own. It's a very famous library. Everybody does pip install Vortex to have vertexes. And you, need, uh, you have a function that's called swirl twice. You get, it's your function. And it expects you give it a vertex, and it calls swirl and swirl. Uh, now, if you write your tests and you just use the journal vertex library in your tests, it will destroy the word twice. And at the end, your test will never finish because there is no more universe. <laughs> so you need to fake the actual vertex. And this, this is, of course, funny and imaginary, but it can be something that I don't know, uses a real API, uh, does something that's not available on the system, you, the tests are being run on, and stuff like that. So you create a fake vertex, or fake something. Here is the class on the top, fake vertex, and you redefine the swirl method just to increase the counter. And then if you create a fake vertex and give your function the fake vertex, uh, you can test if it was called twice without actually calling the vertex itself. So I have some examples in here. Let's try, uh, better go with this, fake. There is some test that passes. It's the very test that was on the slide. Um, actually, I have a mylib.py that has this function. It takes a vertex, swirls, and swirls. I also have the weather library that has the original uh, vertex thing. And if I remove the library, and I can run the tests, and they are still passing. That makes sense. I am not using the library at all. 
Uh, so if you are using fakes, always only use them if you're not trying to test the thing you are faking. Because at the end, if you test the faked thing, you can as well delete the test and just grab a beer instead, because you are testing an imaginary code that's fake. I have another demo for fakes. And it's an unfortunate situation that, what do I have here? The library is created like this, the code you're testing. You don't have a swirl twice that takes a vertex because you don't really care. You have a function that creates a vertex, swirls it, swirls it, and returns it because you need double swirled vertexes all the time. And now you can't really put there some arbitrary vertex, and you could say, let's mock it. But instead, you could change your API to use dependency injection and have an optional, optional argument that takes a vertex and only create a new one if you didn't give it another one. I am slower than I expected, so no demo this time. You just have to trust me. Then there are stops, which is you take a real vertex this time, and you redefine part of it. So let's say we have a real vertex, but what's dangerous or it takes time or whatever is the swirl method. So let's replace it with our lambda that will just return a swirl symbol. That's a swirl symbol if you didn't know. And now we call the double swirl, and we are ensuring it's returning two of those things. So I have the, the test in here. And the test passes. And it never actually calls the library inside the swirl function, but it calls the class. The problem is, if I change this return statement to, this <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to something else, and I run it again, it's passing. So you have to be careful uh, what your test is actually testing. In this case, it's testing the only thing. If the double swirl is called, it returns twice the thing that we gave it uh, as a swirl, or it uh, returns those exact symbols. Then you can parameterize it to check if it's not the case. You can say stops are not enough, and you need an actual mock. An actual mock does two things. It changes what a function or method or callable does, and uh, it instead gives you a return value or an exception or something like that. And it also records how many times it was called, uh, maybe with what arguments and stuff like that. So in this code, we replace the swirl thing with a mock. And the difference between a stop is now that we can actually say as call count two. And we are sure that it was called twice. Now, this is good if you actually need a test that says, test that double swirl calls swirl twice, then it's useful to check it and also sometimes useful to replace what it does. If you don't want to replace it, you can use a spy, which behaves the same way, but it doesn't actually change the value. Let's see the difference. So I have test mock and test spy. They are both passing. Now if I change this to plus, and I'm breaking swirl, but I'm keeping double swirl intact, and I use the mock, it passed because I changed the swirl method. Uh, but if I use the spy, it dumps me some 
thinks, which is the side effect of Swirl, better than if the room explodes, right? And at the top of it, uh, it actually says, yeah, the, the output was not, a, not what you expected. On the other hand, if I change this and make it correct again, but I cheat this, and I simply return it twice. Now, if I use a spy, it will fail once I check the call count. The same thing, of course, happens with the mock, because I'm checking it in both places. So let's have a summary in here. I have 10 minutes. Um, if it's a dependency, you don't need to check or test. If you trust it, it will always work, or uh, the upstream of that library has different tests and stuff like that. And it'll, it is hard to use the original library. Uh, fake it. Fake the library, use a fake. If you can't fake it because your code cannot accept fakes because it creates the, the thing from the library, Extend your API of your functions, of your modules, so they can use custom dependencies. This is the thing when we added an optional attribute for a vertex. This actually makes your code better, because then might be a better vertex library in the next 10 years, and you don't need to change your code, but somebody who is calling it can just put there the better vertex even if you don't really care and you created it 10 years ago when vortexes were really bad at that time. If you need custom results, so if you really need that some function should return something else that it normally does, you stub it or you stub the class or you stub the module, it partially replace the function. So for example, you can stop a random uh, call, so because you need to check in your algorithm that starts with generating some random number that at some point the result looks like this. But if you actually use random in your code, that it's hard to check. So you can stop the random module to return the arbitrary values that you say. So you can have a random generator that always returns four and you swear it's random. If you want to actually test whether something was called by a function, we choose Sometimes don't really need to know. Sometimes you do. You spy it and only use a real mock if you need it all. If you need to change what it does and count how many times it was done, which is, if you think about it, not that common. But people tend to use mock all the time because it's the first thing they find. Be very, very careful about what you actually test. Sometimes it can be that you are testing the fakes, the stops, and the different code that you intended. Uh, we had a project that has like 500 tests for everything, and it was like, if you send a commit, you need to write a test for it. But the code was so complicated that we mocked everything in the tests because we couldn't test it otherwise. And once we realize the program won't even start, but all the tests are green, so a good way to check, it's not 100% sure, but it is a good indicator. If you remove the implementation and the test is still green, you're testing something else. <laughs> don't overmock. Don't use mock when you don't really need to. Uh, I have another demo. It's going to be a short one. So I was, there was an example of ATC password file. So I have something in here. It's a simple code. You don't need to read it all. What's important is here, uh, it opens ATC passes over there, which stores information about users on Linux and Unixes, and it returns a dictionary. It parses this. Now, if I import this and call it, it works. But uh, I don't need no tests, right? But uh, if I want to test it, I might say, 
what system is this being run on? I don't know. I could test if root user is there, but there might be some weird Unix that doesn't have root, or I don't know. So that doesn't work. So what do I have? Test with mock. So I mock it. I change built-ins open to return a string I/O instead of the open file, and I call my thing uh, with mocked open, and I hope everything works. What's the problem? Is that then I go to a conference and somebody has a talk about Pathlib, and I say, "Yeah, Pathlib is so cool. Let's change my code to use Pathlib," and a very simple code change that doesn't change the API and the behavior of the function at all, will completely destroy my tests. Because now I am patching open, not path open, but open. Uh, I need to change this import. And it's failing because uh, it still returns the stuff I have on my system and not the stuff that I mocked. And now I have to think where I am mocking this thing. And should I, when I test the internals of my implementation, I need to change my mock as well. Instead, in this situation, I shall not mock at all because it's so easy to avoid it. All I need to do. Uh, here, is to change the API of my function to accept the path instead of hard coding it inside. And now I can use it with default etc passes over there. The function works as it did before. But here, all I need to do is create a new file, put the content in the file, and give it another path. And now, if I change the implementation, even if I use open, even if I use pathlib, it doesn't really matter because I didn't use mock. I just made the API of my function a little bit different. One could say better, because now if you have a weird Unix that doesn't have this path but a different one, you can still use it. And I made the testing much more simple. What's important is that you don't forget that practicality beats purity. So even if I say, don't mock, you should mock if it works for you. And it always is a better thing to mock, mock, and mock than to not test at all. Just be careful that you are not testing your mocks instead of your code. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mil. And we do have some questions over at Slido. So uh, what mocking library would you recommend for Python? None at all. You can create all the stuff you, you need just uh, with your actual code. So I have, uh, let me see. That's Vortex test with spy. This is a spy. I created it because it was faster than searching a library that does have a spy. It's easy. But really, if you want to use a library, I like to use Flexmock, but it has a very Ruby-ish API. But it's easy to use and easy to remember how to use. Uh, but it is kind of very easy to overmock with that. So be careful much more than anything. There is a, there is a mock in unit test, uh, which has some functions. It probably doesn't have spice, though, and Flexmock does. Thanks. Uh, why do, yo, this is a terminology question. Uh, why do you use cheating when you can use the term test doubles that has been established by Martin Fowler and is widely accepted by the community? Because I didn't know. <laughs> Thanks for admitting that. Uh, and what tooling do you use for your demos? Uh, what's the next command? 
Can I get it back? It's an alias for git reset if I do changes and clear. That's cool. That's not tooling. <laughs> I, just, I just realized when I was uh, testing this presentation that writing git reset hard and clear all the time makes typos and stuff, so I created next. Next. And that's it from Slido. Do we have any more questions here? Any brave soul? Nope. OK, thank you, Miro. Thank you.